Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. With less than five months to go before the American presidential elections, U.S. relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran seem to be moving on two parallel routes. There has been a prisoner swap on the one hand, with expressed calls on the American side to enlarge this opening for a comprehensive deal focusing on Iran's nuclear and regional ambitions, while on the other hand, there are credible reports that the Ayatollah regime is actively enriching its uranium stockpile to levels far beyond civilian use. To better understand the complexity of the latest developments, we're joined from New York City by Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, who was in charge, among others, of the Iran nuclear file and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center at Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome Mr. Meir Javed Anfar, who is in lecture on Iran at the IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Thank you. And with me in the studio here is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Owen, and I'd like to immediately dive into this uh, uh, topic. Uh, Mr. Owen, to what degree should we be concerned by Iran's activities on its nuclear uh, ambitions, uh, even though uh, it keeps uh, claiming that uh, it's doing everything for civilian use, uh, it is quite clear that uh, uh, everything that it has uh, and everything that it is trying to pursue is not necessarily civilian. Well, obviously, we should never be complacent and uh, we should always be concerned uh, when the uh, Iranians are uh, uh, slowly but surely accumulating uh, material and perhaps uh, more than material, uh, which could enable them to um, go nuclear if they make the decision. However, what we are now seeing is the juncture of uh, politics, and especially presidential politics, proliferation, and proxies. Proxies, um, I, the uh, word has two meanings here. Obviously, those uh, militias and other armed groups which the Iranians uh, have been using in Syria, uh, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, their um, uh, militias in Iraq, but also the uh, way that the Americans have used the Swiss uh, in order to uh, cut a deal with the Iranians regarding the prisoner swap and with President Trump uh, coming out uh, and calling um, his Iranian counterparts to uh, get a deal, not only on humanitarian or consular issues, but also the comprehensive deal at the center of which will be a renewed uh, JCPOA um, from five years ago, but a new improved version, a Trump version, but also having to do with other issues, such as the ballistic missiles, uh, such as the uh, proxy wars, uh, whatever the uh, uh, the Iranians have been doing uh, in Baghdad, in Beirut, uh, in Sana'a, and in Damascus. Dr. Ohainonen, I would like to refer the next question to you with regard to two questions, actually. It's a, a two separate uh, angles to, to this challenge. The one, the IAEA has been uh, very uh, frustrated with uh, the Ayatollah regime over its uh, refusal to allow uh, the, the agency's uh, inspectors to visit certain sites which have been uh, uh, in question with regard to nuclear-related uh, activities. Uh, that's uh, the one, to what degree is the IAEA actually capable at this stage uh, of uh, uh, assuring that Iran is not pursuing nuclear weapons. And the second part of it is, last time you were here in Israel, we had the opportunity to sit together and talk about uh, the uh, challenges uh, presented vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran's nuclear ambitions. You were talking about various components uh, uh, or pillars, if you will, with regard to uh, the development of a nuclear uh, uh, bomb. One of those pillars, of course, was the ballistic missile uh, uh, angle, which Iran has managed to attain since that moment that it managed to attain that uh, ballistic missile capability. To what degree are we nearing the breakout point where Iran will just be able to cross the threshold and build the actual nuclear bomb? Thank you. That's a lot of questions. I think that we are in an important juncture at this point of time. 
First of all, I think the international community has to do a tough decision. IAEA has now tried to verify Iran's nuclear program for 18 years. And Iran is still in breach of its basic safeguards obligations to provide the necessary information to the IAEA and provide the access to sites which have been either declared or not declared. So that's one problem in face of the international community. And the IAEA is as strong as its member states want it to be. And our deep problem now is certainly the international situation a little bit, because do the IAEA get some country which takes the leadership and starts to peel down the history of the Iranian nuclear program so that the IAEA can finally verify is this a peaceful program, yes or no. Then the other aspect of this is what happens in the future. That is certainly difficult for the IAEA to predict, but uh, we have to find a mechanism where we can ascertain whatever activist Iran takes in the future, they serve only for peaceful purposes. And one of those to be addressed is the necessity of, for uranium enrichment. Then access to the sites. Why it is so important for IAEA to have access? Actually, I would have preferred to the IAEA hear a little bit more about the access, because it's not only access to sites or facilities, it's access to information, documentation, clarifications to the questions made, and access to the people who have been doing that. And I think that this is something which should be now next done by the Board of Governors, put Iran like in 2004 spring, when we try to access Lavisan or notice that this ought to be done in order to be uh, able to proceed with the implementation of the JCPOA and other parts of the nuclear program. And on the side of uh, breakout point, is Iran uh, rapidly uh, closing in on the capacity of developing a nuclear bomb? Yes, it is. And, and here we have also a little bit of lagoon, because we really don't know what happened with the missile re-entry vehicle and warhead development. IAEA has not addressed that in 2015 as a part of the PMD to the depth. So we don't know how ready Iran is with the missile part of the program. But we ought to keep in our minds that the SCAD missiles and its derivates have been used by Soviet Union and then later Russia for delivery of nuclear weapons. And as North Korea is doing that as well. So that is something which ought to be done. This is a tent with two poles. If you And you need both delivery vehicle and then the weapon and the weapon design, where also Iran has not been forthcoming. And that weapon design has again two parts, the weapon itself and the production of fissile material or uranium enrichment, where IAEA has now a lot of questions to ask. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Javedan Fahl, to what degree do you think at this stage the Iranians are disregarding uh, all their previous uh, understandings under the NPT rather than the JCPOA, which is the nuclear deal. Uh, it is still a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency has been very uh, frustrated, as I previously said, about uh, uh, Iranian non-compliance. And just recently we heard the uh, Iranians responding uh, to the uh, frustration of the IAEA, saying that they're willing to cooperate and are indeed interested interested in cooperating with the IAEA, but not necessarily on uh, reports given by, allegedly by the United States and Israel, which were made public, uh, of course, by Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu about the so-called uh, Mossad archive, uh, which uh, unveiled a lot of uh, information with regard to specific sites in Tehran, something that uh, the Iranians do not want to uh, make uh, available in their perspective, according to what I understand, is because they don't want uh, the Americans and Israelis to be party to this process. Um, look, the way the Iranian, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for inviting me. The, the way the Iranians basically see it is this. Uh, Trump walked out of the nuclear deal. 
uh, and, bas and the, basically, you know, the, the most important part of the nuclear deal is no longer there. So Iran, uh, you know, you can't hold Iran responsible. You can't say Iran uh, has to abide by the deal when, they are when the Americans are not abiding by the deal and they're actually pressuring other countries, uh, such as Europe, not to do business with Iran, um, uh, which basically makes it even worse for Iran now because Iran is now under even tougher sanctions uh, than before. This is the way the Iranians see it. So uh, how does the Iranian regime, which is under these tough conditions, uh, try to get out of the current situation? They, they are basically trying to, um, to rely on the only uh, method which, think, which they think will serve their interests. What is that method? To make sure that Trump is not re-elected. The Iranian regime does not want Trump re-elected. Therefore, by, uh, the, the, the view in Tehran seems to be that if you comply with the IAEA, if you make it easy... For the, you know, if you continue cooperating with the IAEA, then Trump can say, look, this is the only language that the Iranians understand. Uh, I'm the one who brought them, who, who basically, I'm the one who uh, uh, removed Qasem Soleimani, and now I'm the one who has managed to bring their nuclear program under, who has brought the nuclear program under control without giving them any economic benefits. So they want to make sure that the opposite happens. They want to make sure that Trump cannot use such an argument. So we see that they're taking measure, measures such as the one you mentioned, not allowing access to some of the sites which, uh, uh, yes, the intelligence apparently came from America or Israel, but this is the IAEA that's asking them. It's not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel that's asking for access. It's the IAEA. And although the Iranians are obliged to give uh, such uh, access to the IAEA, they're not doing so big for political reasons because, again, go back to the original point, they don't want to give Trump uh, any uh, a victory, basically, prior uh, to his re-election campaign. You're talking a lot about the re-election campaign, something that uh, has been mentioned in, in di by different analysts and experts uh, across the board. Uh, are the Iranians actually interfering or actively interfering to try and uh, bolster uh, Trump's uh, uh, political competitor, uh, Mr. Biden, for president? Well, uh, um, to be honest with you, I don't see them praising Biden because they're also aware of uh, his uh, close relations with Israel. That, As far as the Iranians are concerned, Biden is also a friend of Israel, but they're trying to make sure it's between a rock and a hard place. Uh, Biden is the lesser of two evils. Um, I think the Iranians also realize that Biden won't be removed, be able to remove all the sanctions, but he, you know, he's going to go back to the nuclear deal the way they see it, and at least some of the sanctions will, will, will be removed. And the only thing that the Iranians can do for now is to make sure that they don't give Trump uh, any, anything that he can use to his own credit in his campaign. There have been also, I must add, uh, some reports regarding Iranian information campaigns uh, by, in order to uh, interfere in the uh, campaigning, especially in the cyber, you know, in the cyber space. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how effective uh, that will be. Indeed. Mr. Owen, you uh, uh, started your uh, analysis at the beginning with the word complacency. Now, it seems like there is uh, somewhat of complacency, especially on the European side, the Chinese and the Russians uh, openly declare that they want to uh, preserve the deal and that's the only uh, component available. But the Europeans have been very vocal against the Iranians when it comes to its regional malign activities. It's been very vocal in the past, especially France in the past. Uh, when uh, the 2015 nuclear deal was being uh, negotiated, there was a lot of discussions uh, from the, uh, the French side about concerns vis-a-vis -vis the ballistic uh, uh, pillar to this, uh, to this uh, deal. To what degree do you see this complacency actually now with uh, Dr. Heinonen also mentioning the fact that uh, the Board of Governors or the member states of, of the IAEA are the ones who provided the mandate under uh, UN Security Council, of course, but uh, if they're not resolved about assuring uh, the, the Iranian uh, 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 activities remain under the nuclear deal, why would uh, this be any better in the near future? Well, you know, uh, Stalin uh, uh, was quoted as uh, asking, uh, how many divisions does the Pope have, or the Vatican? And the IAEA uh, is in the same position. There are no divisions uh, in Vienna uh, waiting to assault 
anyone. The Board of Governors, if they uh, uh, come up with a finding similar to what everyone is concerned about, must go to the Security Council. And uh, at the Security Council, obviously, there will be vetoes by China and Russia. So a formula must be found which uh, will be uh, agreeable to all of the permanent members of the uh, Security Council. Now, you mentioned the 2015 uh, situation where Obama was um, president, Biden was the vice president. He may very well be elected, and one of the uh, uh, candidates right now for his uh, number two is Suzanne Rice, who was the national security advisor for Obama. So it could be uh, a return to the Obama policy. In that case, uh, we may uh, uh, talk about uh, an improved uh, 2015 deal, but we are not uh, uh, there yet. Now, as regards uh, the uh, complacency, uh, you know, when the uh, Wright brothers took off um, in uh, uh, Kill Devil Hill in North Carolina in December of uh, 1903, uh, the United States had total aerial superiority in the world because this was the first and only flight um, of uh, a heavier than air uh, object. But it took several years for an air force to emerge. If the Iranians crossed the threshold and get one bomb, it will be detrimental from their point of view because this will only serve as uh, a reason or a pretext, depending on your uh, point of view, uh, for attacking and preempting them. They need uh, a full force, a full nuclear force of several uh, missiles with nuclear warheads, with the right range, with accuracy. Um, and that means that for them, it is very useful to prod, but not to provoke. They want to do what they are doing now in order for the other powers uh, to um, still be on edge uh, and come forward and suggest some deal. But they don't want to do too much and provoke an attack either by the Trump administration or by the Netanyahu government. Of course, it would be detrimental to them if they would be uh, dumb enough to use this, uh, pardon my French, and uh, uh, unless they use it without any trace, as they're using proxies all the time in Yemen, in Iraq, and elsewhere, uh, which uh, apparently, you know, the, the Aramco oil installations were attacked by Houthi rebels, uh, who ultimately uh, weren't targeted in return, and neither was Iran. But that's that's uh, the, uh, the difference um, between a weapon of mass destruction and everything else. Even though right now, precision guided munitions uh, with conventional warheads can have a devastating effect, not to mention chemical and biological warheads. But nevertheless, the world looks at it differently if it's nuclear or if it's non-nuclear. Dr. Heinonen, what is your greatest concern at this stage with regard to Iran's nuclear ambition? I think that it has two aspects. One is that where Iran is marching and when it's now approaching the threshold, it will use it as a support of its other activities as a potential nuclear threshold state. But then I have to look at the Middle East. And would the Saudis and others sit calmly and see Iran building its nuclear capabilities? Most likely not. And we have heard it from from the leader itself, or a young leader of Saudi Arabia, we have heard it from Tur Mr. Turki al Faisal, that they are also preparing for similar route as what Iran has taken. And there are already signs up. They have started uranium mining activities. They are building their nuclear infrastructure. So we will see much more complex situation in a couple of years' time. And I think that this is pretty much the path which uh, Amos Yadlin uh, said or was painting maybe three, four years ago, what could take place with the Saudi Arabia. So there are many other aspects which we need to think about it. But the bottom here is, and this was mentioned already, 
that Iran has now been able to play this game 18 years, since 2002. Been stalemating, delaying, building its nuclear capabilities slowly but steadily, has a sizable stock of uh, enriched uranium, which can be further enriched in fairly short point of time. I hope there are no undeclared or unknown major facilities, but there's never a perfect intelligence. Let's not forget mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is the last time when we can put a threshold and find some other arrangements to deal with this nuclear deal, and particularly with the uranium enrichment. I think it's important for uh, the sake of our viewers to say Amos Yadlin, the director of the Institute for National Security Studies here in Israel, the former uh, military intelligence chief. Uh, I have a follow-up question to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Heinonen, with regard to uh, what you just said. To what degree do you see at a time when uh, the Russians are building a nuclear uh, development uh, facility in Turkey, another one in uh, Egypt, and uh, you're talking, of course, also about Saudi Arabia, where there are different agreements with Russia on that as well. Uh, do you see a nuclear arms race in case that Iran uh, uh, does reach that level of a nuclear threshold state? Well. It's a hard to predict, but it's also a definition of what is the limit. Because just to even to have a stockpile of enriched uranium, it's good enough. And let's look it back in the history in Saudi Arabia, uh, sorry, South Africa. They had half a dozen nuclear weapons, not very com complex ones. They had decent amount of high enriched uranium, uh, and, and they were play able to maintain their regime for decades with that token, until they decided to do other way. And this is what we are, might see in the worst case, not only in Iran, but in the Middle East. And this is my concern. And then my concern at the same time is that the non-proliferation regime is deteriorating. Iran has been able to play this now 18 years. Syria has been playing it since 2011. There is no one action in the UN Security Council with regard to the nuclear program of Syria. And today, uh, Mr. Grossi again reported, no, no progress. I think that there needs to be a fundamental change if we want to live in a safe, nuclear safe world in decades to come. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Javed Anfar, somebody who's uh, closely following uh, everything in Iran, being a uh, uh, former Iranian yourself, to what degree do you see uh, the current regime that is not necessarily working on rational uh, uh, thoughts, but sometimes is uh, pushed from a, a religious-slash-ideological standpoint uh, to export the revolution, as they say. Do you think that uh, their activities are uh, completely rational when it comes to its activities in uh, maybe negotiating in a certain uh, uh, place its position uh, while at the same time not placing itself under the so-called Western uh, 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 hand or, or power? Look, the Iranian regime wants to have room for man maneuver and, and one of the ways it can have room for maneuver is against the West is by having allies abroad and that, that gives Iran leverage in the negotiations which the Iranian regime wants to use. Uh, Iran cannot rely on its economy because its economy is tanking. So, you know, that, yeah, it knows that its economy is the Achilles heels and, and Trump is going to uh, basically keep hitting that Achilles heels with sanctions. So Iran needs to find other uh, sources of leverage. And this is why we see the Iranian regime uh, currently um, supporting the Assad regime. But the problem is that uh, in... Uh, in um, Excuse me. The, the problem is that the Iranian regime is currently facing a major problem in terms of its leverage abroad. We see that the, uh, the economy in Syria is tanking. The, the lira now is at its lowest, we at its lowest level ever. And, the, the, and there have even been uh, demonstrations in the formerly pro-Assad uh, sections of the Jewish community in Syria. So therefore, you know, this, the Iranian regime is facing a major, major problem in uh, in uh, in Syria because the the Assad regime is having it maybe it maybe cannot survive, and we can see what the the, the internal developments uh, that are happening. Mahlouf, the former co the cousin of President Bashar al-Assad, is now out. So you know, in terms of having leverage uh, in Syria, especially which by extension gives Iran leverage over Lebanon, 
the Iranian regime is facing a major threat uh, to its standing in Syria. All right, well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a very short analysis uh, as we have less than two minutes left. Dr. Heinonen, we'll uh, start with you. First of all, I think that, as I said, we are now facing a situation where these tough decisions have been done. I'm not overly optimistic that in next one year much happens, because first of all, we have here in the U.S. the presidential election. The second thing is that there will be also presidential election next year in, in uh, Iran. And this takes place at the time when actually here a new president or the old president will continue. And there will be no negotiations with Iran in a real sense before uh, August next year. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Javed Anfal? Uh, right now, I think where Iran is major, facing a major problem is its influence in Syria. The Syrian economy is facing the probably the most severe crisis it has faced since uh, the start of the, uh, the civil war, uh, with demonstrations even taking part in the, the pro-Assad areas that are populated by the Druze. They are now demonstrating against the Assad regime. So the uh, weakening of the uh, economy of Syria uh, can really hit Iran's influence in that country and as a result reduce Iran's leverage against the United States. Mr. Owen? The problem is the timeline. The maximum pressure campaign, uh, which Secretary of State Pompeo announced two years ago in May, has been working, but not fast enough. So it will not happen before the elections. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Dr. Heinonen, Mr. Javed Anfal, as well as Mr. Owen for being with us and uh, joining us from afar. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.